No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I used brown before. I used white. Cool, thanks. Oh, thank you. You want to go over this? Oh, shoot. Yeah, just um, it's uh, it's kind of a paradise here for us. We're uh, it's something it's it's a property that we've had for a while and that we've worked on. Um, I actually grew up on this property until the age of 20. I was from from ages uh, age six all the way up to 20 years, and um, it looked a lot different then. There was a lawn here in the backyard. My brother and I used to play football. Um, it was my dad landscaped the place originally. He was the one that, that uh, originally introduced me to plants and getting and uh, and landscaped the hillside with natives. And so that was my first um, taste of, of gardening and of horticulture and, and uh, just basically fell in love with it after that. And uh, even worked on my grandmother's farm in Pennsylvania and that kind of that kind of sealed the deal. Um, I studied uh, horticulture, landscape architecture. I didn't get a degree in landscape architecture, but did study it, and then um, went and worked with the wholesale nursery. Um, currently, I work with Charles at Ivy Organic, and I also work for a wholesale nursery as well. So that's that's kind of my um, background uh, in, a, in a in a nutshell. Um, this property, this this whole area, actually uh, used to be inhabited by the Chumash Indians, and um, it was part of a Spanish land grant. Um, the Indians actually lived up in the hills here. They had an encampment someplace. Um, and that mountain up there uh, that you see when you come in, it's, it was their sacred mountain. It was called, they called it Blackfoot. It's right, it's, it's uh, Coing, now called Coinga Peak. Um, but it's, at one point in time, the Indians were roaming right through this area. And so it's, uh, you know, it feels very special to us. We feel very fortunate to live here. Um, uh, from the point of when uh, my mother passed away and, and my, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, when, when I moved in um, to the house, we made some big changes. Um, we, my wife is from Morocco originally, and so you'll see a lot of the features in here. I wanted to, I traveled with her a couple times to Morocco, and you'll see some of the features like the fountain, uh, the casbah. These are uh, definitely um, architectural features that you'll see if you travel to Morocco. And uh, we spent some time thinking about it, and um, I designed it, you know, use it with, with, a, with a little bit of, of uh, education that I had in landscape architecture. I wanted to have a linear landscape, which is typical in that part of the world. In, in uh, the Middle East, that's, uh, you know, in Persia, they, they do a lot of linear landscapes. And so it's that, you know, we consider it, and, it was, and Charles said earlier, kind of like the Garden of Eden. This is, this is for us, this is the place that we come to relax and enjoy. So I hope today that that, uh, that you folks are are, are relaxed and, and um, you know that we uh, we talk about some t topics that are interesting to you and um, we can explore. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you kind of a quick outline of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, I one one of my uh, one of my favorite classes of plants is citrus. I love citrus. I uh, love working with them, and over the years, have through trial and error, have have uh, um, been successful with them, and sometimes. You just, you know, like with any plant, it's, they're, they're fun because you just never know what's going to come at you. You've, you've, you've learned how to fertilize them, uh, you learn how to uh, uh, prune them, mulch them, uh, treat them for pests and diseases, and then all of a sudden something else comes along. A leaf turns yellow, and, and then what do you do then? So that's been my experience over the years. Uh, my firm belief, um, and Charles knows this, is that everything starts from the soil moving up. So if you don't have a healthy soil, um, you're not going to have healthy plants and you have to really understand the plants that you're working with and the soil that you have on site before you start and that's you know it's as easy as uh, doing a, just a quick soil test um, by digging up a little bit of soil in the garden putting it in a, in a jar shaking it up and see it, uh, the particulates you know whether you have a clay soil whether you have a loamy soil a sandy soil and then you know where to go from there and that's you know either amending it or just choosing plants that work well within that, that, uh, that soil. Citrus, um, citrus tend to like uh, a more free-draining soil. Um, many times, a lot of people uh, they, they incorporate uh, they, a lot of uh, a lot of organic material. Um, sometimes um, sand in, in the in the mix when they're planting it. So the, the idea behind citrus is is that you have to be very um, citrus have to have uh, they don't like wet wet uh, wet roots or wet feet. They like to be um, they like to be uh, kind of basically on the well-drained side. 
Uh, they like to dry out a little bit, and so that is, um, you know, those are those are the factors that I uh, that I took into account before I planted them. And you can see all the way across here, which is part of the design of the landscape. Um, we've got citrus planted there. We've got uh, lemons. Um, we've got uh, oranges. Sure. So anyhow, we've got uh, on on site here. We've got kumquats. Um, we've got tangerines. We've got oranges. Um, we've got lemons. We've got limes. Um, no grapefruit. I, it's it's uh, it, it's not something that we're crazy about. So we we don't have grapefruit on site. But eventually, maybe someday. Um, and so it's it, we've over the years we've had some pretty nice harvest. Um, later on, if you see these um, kumquats right here in the pots, um, it's that's a that's a very specialized um, you know kumquats are, are obviously a specialized uh, type of citrus. Not everybody likes them. Um, some people like to eat them, pop them in their mouth, and eat it. You know, with the rind, it's kind of sweet on the outside. Um, I've got some marmalade uh, jam that my uh, wife made uh, out of at, off of right off these kumquats right here. Later on, I'll have we'll uh, we'll try that. And uh, so it's just it's you can do citrus in containers. You can do it straight in the ground. Does everybody know that citrus can be either um, true dwarf, semi dwarf, or full size? It all depends on the rootstock that it goes on. And so over the years, you know, I was working for a nursery, so I got the citrus for free, so I took whatever I could get. So there's actually a mix there of dwarf, uh, semi, there's uh, semi dwarf and regular size. Like you can see the Meyer, or the uh, Eureka lemon over there, that's a full size uh, lemon. Um, and then the Meyer next to it, I have to keep cutting it back so it matches the size of the other trees. So there's, those are the different classifications that the, um, that the citrus, that, that you can buy them from a nursery. Uh, you can buy them in those sizes. It depends on the space that you have at home. So anyway, um, it's, it, and citrus, of course, I'm sure that you, know, you folks know that, that citrus have been around since the time of the, uh, of the Egyptians and the Chinese. Um, they did, had different, uh, at that point in time, there was uh, four different uh, uh, genre. There was, um, uh, genera, I'm sorry, uh, there was the citrus, uh, there was uh, the citron, uh, the mandarin orange, the pomelo, and the uh, papita. Um, I didn't know this, I studied a little bit uh, beforehand, but that's our modern day citrus. We're derived from crosses of those different types of citrus that were uh, available originally. And, uh, and then eventually the, the Spanish brought it here to the New World, uh, to Florida, in the 14 and 1500s. And so that's, you know, of course, that's why Florida has all those, those wonderful oranges. Um, the place, of course, citrus love to be in a, in a full sun location, in a very sunny location. I'm saying, you know, they, they say six hours, I'm saying at least eight hours so that they can, uh, they can, they can grow well, that the fruit can mature. Um, some citrus, uh, some of like the, the navel oranges don't mature well unless they have full deep like uh, interior heat. So you might choose a Valencia in that case. So, but, but in any, in any case, it's, they, they do best when they're in full sun. So always choose a, a full sun location. If you're putting them in a pot, make sure um, that you choose a variety that's a semi-dwarf or a dwarf. Um, again, like these, uh, these kumquats are doing quite well there. Um, maybe in about three or four years from now, I'll have to transplant those, put new soil in there. Um, just so you know, on those, on those particular pots, I fertilize those once a month. Um, with a with a, a special uh, fertilizer, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about the fertilizer a little bit later on. But with trees that are on the ground, I do it four times a year. I start in the in the springtime, you know, early spring, maybe January, February. Up here, we don't get as much frost, so I can I can go ahead and, and fertilize that early. Um, maybe in the valley, in the San Fernando Valley, or out in New Hall, if you were out that way, you wouldn't want to encourage them. You wouldn't want to fertilize so early. Um, I do my last for I. I fertilized the last probably in August, September. September will probably be the last time that I fertilize for the year. And um, it's, you know, since we're talking about it, um, I do use a couple different varieties of fertilizer. Um, I actually use, um, this is, I use EB Stone. And the great thing about this, I'm not, I don't get any money for promoting them. It's just, it's just a, a it could be anything. It could be EB Stone, it could be uh, Kellogg's, but but it's uh, I always uh, fertilize with organic only, and I mix up the fertilizers because not every single fertilizer you buy is going to be complete. So it's always best, and it's not always fast acting. The great thing about this is it has um, it also uh, has mycorrhizae bacteria in it, which can help root growth on citrus. And of course, you know with the citrus, the, the roots are, are traveling right real close to the surface. You have to be careful with them. 
and um, you want to make sure that they're absorbing with that mycorrhizae, they, uh, of course they can absorb the nutrients better from the soil. So when you get a fertilizer like this, it has all that, it has it in there. It's a slow, it's, the nice thing is it's, it is, uh, it's a slow release. It has blood meal, feather meal, bone meal, dried chicken manure, bat guano, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, and potassium sulfate. But this is not, it's not enough as far as I'm concerned. So I go ahead and I use uh, fish emulsion and I go ahead and spray it on the leaves at the end of the day to be able to, um, you know, and I basically in between. And so that way the, it's, you know, hopefully the citrus gets everything it needs as far as the, the trace elements, the basic, uh, the basic nutrients, and that allows it, of course, it needs to have nitrogen to, to obviously um, to, uh, to for the growth. Um, but it also, has, uh, it also needs the micronutrients, the sulfur and the iron, um, as well to produce fruit. So it's, it's important to get a well-balanced uh, fertilizer to start with and then use a supplemental liquid if, if at least that's, that's the way that I do it. Now how many, yes? Do you add micronutrients at all? Those, uh, I don't separately, but um, you know, occasionally I'll use, like I'll use bone meal or I'll use blood meal. But I just ba basically I, I kind of create a cocktail um, that, uh, that I, I mix it up, and hopefully it gets all the nutrients that it needs. Like that EB Stone, it does have a lot of the micronutrients in it, and that's the reason why I chose it is because it's, it's a higher quality fertilizer. Nursery to plant, or any nursery, um, you want to make sure that uh, you know that obviously you've got a good straight trunk. Um, you want to make sure that the branching, you don't have any kind of weak crotch uh, or or you have any weak points in the in the plant itself. You want to make sure that there's no circling roots at the very top of the plant. So when you're at the very top of the root, you have the root collar. So if I don't see any circling roots up here. And then if you really get, want to get kind of crazy with it, you can pull it out and take a look at it. And this is actually not a bad root system right here. You can see it's got a good, uh, it's got a, a fairly fibrous root system. You don't see any heavy roots circling around there, but that's really what you really want to look at. You want to make sure there's no crossover roots or anything along those lines. So it's always best, it's like anything else um, that you choose in life, garbage in, garbage out. So if you choose, if you, if you make your selection of a citrus, look at it very carefully, look at the trunk, look at the branching pattern so you, can, you know you have a good scaffolding, a uh, good scaffold on the very top, and look at the, at the root crown. Even if you can't pull it out, that should be able to tell you. And if it's an old plant or if it's off color, you really don't want it. Are there any specific nurseries you recommend for citrus? Well, I'll tell you that the, the good nurseries that produce the citrus, there's Durlings. Durlings is, 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 Where is it? Durlings is down in San Diego. And you could call Durlings, um, Fallbrook area, and you could call Durlings morning, and ask them where, they, where uh, they send their material to in your area, and I'm sure they would tell you. But it's, to me, is, is my experience is that Durlings does one of the best, uh, does, does the best citrus as far as the way it's pruned, the color on it. Um, I know there's also Duarte and Laverne, and, uh, but it's not, uh, I'm not as impressed with their quality as, as Durling. So um, I, would, I would highly recommend Durling. I would just call them in Fallbrook and ask them where, you know, where they send their, their trees to. So planting, and again, uh, it's, the, these days it used to be when I was in the nursery business years ago, when you put a plant in the ground, you dug it that, that far again uh, below the root ball. That was kind of the old thought process. These days, of course, now everybody learned that it's the most important thing is the lateral root growth. It doesn't hurt to actually dig the root ball four times the size of the diameter. I mean, the, 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 the hole it's going into four times the size of the diameter and actually a little bit shy of the depth of it. So you might want to, you, instead of being, uh, being to the very top, you might want to dig a little bit short because plants actually, you want the root to be, the, the root collar to be a, a little bit higher um, than the existing soil and put a well around it because that way um, there's no chance, or there's you know less chance of any kind of root rot or problems down the line. Um, the soil, depending upon the soil you have, you want to choose a very high quality planting uh, planting mix, um, preferably with a lot of uh, organic, uh, solid organic matter, even like a, like a, uh, potentially like a redwood, uh, maybe a redwood base or a fir base. Um, but just make sure it's a high quality planting mix um, that's st stay away from anything that has germinator in it. So it's just that's those are. As, as far as I'm concerned, that is that's it's important. And once once you've got it planted and you've got the soil mixed properly and it's in the ground and you've properly compacted it and you've watered it, make sure you put something. Um, on, are you folks familiar with a product called Super Thrive? I use it on all my new plantings, and 
Um, I've always had good success with it. Um, there may be other products out there, but it's a good way to get to, to kind of kickstart the uh, kickstart it. Um, one thing I forget I forgot to mention is that you can also put a pre-plant fertilizer in there. If you can get a pre-plant fertilizer that's real low in nitrogen because you don't want to burn the roots and has that mycorrhizae bacteria in it, that mycorrhizae bacteria is going to actually help that uh, uh, help help the roots take off and, and help the exchange right away so that the plant has has vigor immediately. Um, best time to plant is, uh, of course, as, as you know, is probably, in, you know, the citrus starts appearing in the springtime. Um, I wouldn't plant it early, too early, like January, February, but maybe March, April, and then, of course, in the fall before it gets cold. So, um, has, are, is everybody familiar with the proper way to mulch? And do you know why, do, do we know why we mulch? Okay. Mulching is important for all plants, um, and the, it, some plants don't like to have mulch all the way to the very, uh, to the very edge of the, uh, of the uh, uh, trunk itself, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, the, where the root collar is. Citrus, and, and later on we'll walk over here and we'll look at it and I'll point it out, citrus like to be mulched too, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, number one is if you use a good quality mulch, and I, I actually produce my own mulch, I, I, I compost and um, put it right on top. So that compost has, not only does it have wood product in it, but it has uh, garden clippings in there, it has chicken manure in it. So it's got, it's, it's nice and rich, and it's slowly releasing nutrients into the soil. It's breaking down, it's releasing it into the soil and feeding that, that, uh, uh, that citrus. So that's a supplemented part, of, part of, of feeding it. Number two is it's preventing weeds from coming up um, around, the, uh, uh, around the, uh, uh, the trunk and uh, you know, under, under the drip line as well. And that's important. You don't want the you don't want to ha don't want to have to deal with weeds. You don't want them, of course, stealing the nutrients from the tree. So that's that's a good thing as well. Final thing is I don't know if you guys uh, knew it, but uh, actually there is beneficial bacteria in mulch that actually can kill the bacteria that might uh, that might affect the, the plant adversely, um, that might cause root rot. So if it's mulch, if it's the correct mulch, I mean, it's stay away from anything eucalyptus because it has the tannins in it that can poison the plant. But if you have a nice, good mixed mulch that's good and it's not, it's not too heavy and not too wet and soggy, it actually can help the, the citrus as far as um, maintaining a nice, you know, a proper uh, temperature for the root zone, good moisture, you'll have to water less, you won't have weeds, and it'll also feed it as well. So mulching is very important on citrus. And I'll point that out later when we walk out there. Um, we spoke about fertilization. Um, we're going to talk um, about irrigation real quickly, and then we'll, we'll get into pest control. Um, irrigation, and, and, and Charles, what was the term about uh, the, uh, it was like duplicating rain. I forget rain. what that was. There's mimic, mimic rain. Mimic it's, rain, yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that, that's a good, it's when you're, ir, when you're irrigating, basically what you're doing is you are, mimic, uh, you are actually mimicking or, or duplicating um, precipitation, natural precipitation. And so you want to try and, the whole idea is this, is that, uh, and, and Charles and I spoke about this, I used to have on these citrus over here, I used to have one bubbler on one side of the plant. Well, you know what happens is the plant gets watered on one side, so the roots on that side pull the water in, the rest of the, the, rest of the tree is kind of suffering on the other sides because it's used to, it, it, in, in the wild or naturally, it would get water for precipitation from all sides. So what I did recently, oh, probably about like four months back, is I actually triangulated my bubbler so that I had a bubbler on each side of, of, the, uh, of the tree itself. So now right under the, the canopy, you know, of course, they call it the drip line, right under the drip line, it's got, basically, it's got water all the way around. So now the tree is much happier and they're, and they're doing better and it's gonna be a healthier tree. So, that's, that's important. Um, as, as you probably know from the past, citrus like to dry out a little bit between waterings. Um, what I do is, if I have, and we'll go over there and we'll try it out, but if I'm unsure and I want to kind of test it, a, a, a system to see how long I should be watering it, you know, I turn it on for maybe 20 minutes. Um, I can, this is called the soil probe, and I can actually punch it right into the soil, push it in, pull it out, and I can take a look, and if it's, like in, in this case, it's kind of, it's pretty firm. It's a little crumbly, but it's, it's firm enough and it's moist. That's about the right moisture level in, in there. And it's quick and it's easy test. And then if that's, if that's the case, then that's, I, I'm just gonna dial it in that way with my irrigation in the future. If it's heavy and it's soggy, I need to cut back on the irrigation because that's, they, they don't, citrus doesn't like that. If it's dry and crumbly and falls apart when I pull it out, 
I'm not watering enough. So that, this is the quick test to find out if your irrigation is proper or not. You know, just you have to play with it, you have to dial it in, and also different times of the year. Now when you mulch, you're gonna have to water much less, which is good, that's a good thing. You don't have to spend as much money on it, um, and the plant's gonna be happier as well. So that's, uh, you know, as Charles said, mimicking rain is a good thing. Um, and then, uh, but I, I like to do it with bubblers. And so by triangulating the bubblers all the way around the drip line, um, I think I've done it. I think the, 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 trees, the trees are pretty happy at this point in time. Um, pruning. Okay, generally for the most part, citrus don't really need to be pruned. Um, they can be pruned to shape. Um, they can be pruned, uh, you know, like if, if like this, this one um, bears lime over there behind the palm tree, it gets too big. So I have to prune it back just to keep it the same size as the others. You might want to prune any crossover branches, open it up a little bit, any dead branches on the inside, but for the most part, they don't really need to be pruned. They're evergreen and they're, they're happy that way. Um, but if you're just, if you want to maintain the overall structure of the tree, that's, that is, it's a good time to do it. You don't want to do it in the cold of winter because you don't want to any, encourage any new growth. Whenever you prune, obviously you're going to push, it's going to, the, the, the plant's going to naturally, or the tree's going to respond by putting new growth out. If I'd say any of the warmer months, you're okay pruning. Um, let's talk. Let's talk about uh, if, any questions so far on the topics I've covered. No, I mean if, if citrus have some some specific pests. You know, like scale and um, you know, and uh, occasionally you know they, they do get sooty mold on them and um, leaf miner. You know, so and we'll, we're about ready to talk about that. But the roly polies now. Charles. I got a um, question, but I want to hit on the roly polies. In my garden, I like the roly polies, the slugs and the snails and like everything, especially under my trees, because it's breaking down all the organics, including the roly polies. So I consider them beneficial insects. They're more of a pest on your seedlings and those things. That's when I'd be concerned, but as you'd maybe if you were to use a guard, you would guard around the seedlings, but not around the trees, because they're beneficial in that respect. Um, you mentioned in regards to mulch about beneficial bacteria, but I remember in another talk you gave, you talked about how it combats rot, root rot. Can you explain that more? Okay. Just the power of mulch. I know it's, like, it's really important. I want them to understand like the true benefits of mulch. I mean, aside from the four points you made, I mean, uh, I know we had a discussion like about how it potentially could be like antibiotics or, um, or beneficial. I don't know if you can expand on, on that part of it. Okay, yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the idea is um, that with that mulch that you put down there, there, there's, of course, good and bad bacteria. And when you're applying the mulch, there is the good bacteria that you're applying down with it. And there is, there's, there's um, Phytophthora in the soil. Phytophthora is root rot. I don't know if you're, are you familiar with that. Um, there is beneficial bacteria and, and uh, of course, in substances in the, uh, in the mulch, of course, as it decays. And those bacteria, those helpful bacteria, combat the Phytophthora and keep it down to a low level. The problem is, is that when you get a when you get a, a point where um, a plant is stressed out, the Phytophthora is always in the soil. It's there. Root rot's always in the soil. It's, it attacks the tree. Some trees will be attacked when um, they're stressed out, like when the soil is too wet, and the, and of course there's no oxygen in the soil, so the so the so then the Phytophthora goes 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 to goes to town on that. Or if the, if the uh, tree is stressed in another way, it doesn't have enough water or other reasons. And so with, by having the beneficial bacteria, it comes out of the mulch. Um, it's kind of like, like an antibiotic. It helps, uh, it, helps out the, the, it helps the tree combat the Phytophthora and the, you know, AKA root rot that's in the soil. So that's, that's the idea uh, behind um, mulching. Um, you talked before about pruning. Mm -hmm. One of my lemon trees has kind of an offshoot with some very sharp thorns almost coming mm. out, coming off of that. It's probably a sucker from the bottom, right? No, but it's actually, it's from the bottom, but it's part of the lemon tree itself. Oh, it's it's now, from the there's a it's it's a grafted tree now. most likely. It's a grafted tree. So it's coming that's from that, that's it's sure. it's coming from the from the graft at the bottom. It just take it off. It's a sucker. All right, so that's definitely not part of the lemon itself. We no, no, just take it off. Anything that comes from below the graft, you always want to keep it clipped. Yeah, it's the rootstock, and the rootstock is helps the plant either it restricts the plant because it, it's you know if it's a semi dwarf it's not as vigorous, or if it's a, a stronger disease resistant stock it, it it helps the vigor of the plant. 
All right. Um, we'll talk a little bit about pests now. Um, a pest can be, they can be rodents, it can be uh, aphid scale, um, it can be, uh, you know, we're talking, I'm talking about the more common ones. Um, citrus leaf miner, which is, which is the one that, that, that actually disfigures the plants. And, um, and, and we'll have a little walk around, and I've, I've actually been doing different things with the citrus here. I'm actually running trials, um, so I'm, I'm using different substances on the, on the citrus, so we can talk about that. Now, um, rodents. Um, I have a problem with ground squirrels here. Terrible problem. This, the hill is full of ground squirrels. And um, you guys probably, may, many of you probably don't have that problem. I do. And, I, and, and they, I, I dream about them at night. So, you know, that's how bad it is. I have bad dreams. So, I'll tell you this. I've got a, right up here, right up here, I found this. My gardener found it. And there's, there's actually a den of coyotes that live up here. Less than 100 feet up, up the hill there. We just, we, we, we and, and we hear them. I've seen them come out and there's babies in there too. Now, now the thing is, now the thing is, it, bingo. I've noticed that my rabbit and squirrel population have gone down. I used to dislike the coyotes because of the chickens, you know, they, and I have a cat too. So, uh, you know, and I've heard they're aggressive. I don't, they don't bother me, but, um, but now, um, but now our, our ground squirrel population, our rabbit population is way down. So naturally, it's being taken care of. There's, there's one pest control method, and I didn't even have to ask for it. It just, it just naturally appeared up here. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, as far as if you, if, if you don't want to trap and you want to protect your trees, um, I'm going to let Charles talk about that because uh, that's actually his, you know, that's his department. But the product, Ivy Organic, um, one of the benefits of it, it's a three-in-one, one of the benefits is rodents. So if you actually use it as a paint, mix it in its full, in its full strength, and paint the trunk of the tree, um, you know, the many times they will actually chew on the, they'll actually chew. I've, I've had my fig trees, I've had two fig trees killed by the ground squirrels because they were actually um, chewing or girdling the, the trunk. Um, once I start painting the trees, had no problems, even the ground squirrels were, were present. Even though they were running into the chicken house and, and stealing the food, at least they weren't touching my trees. Now they were going after the fruit, so once I started spraying the fruit with the IV organic on, on the fruit itself, they didn't like the taste of it because it tasted like rosemary or garlic, you know, just something that they didn't naturally go after. So um, that, is, that is a way to divert the ground squirrels to go someplace else. I, I mean, IV is it's just, the thing is, is that the reason why I have so much rosemary out there and it's not touched, it's not molested, or the garlic that's in my, in my garden over here is because of the fact that animals don't like it. Pests don't like it for the most part. And so it's, you know, I mean, that's the whole thing is that it's mixed with paint. So when you spray it on there, you're basically fooling the animal or the insect into thinking it's something else and they don't like it. You mean as far as eat, eat something to eat yourself? Yeah, because like if you, apply, you, can, you can wash it off. I mean, like, oh, like okay. it's my, my, I've got apple trees over there. The, the apples have IV organic sprayed on them. I can, I can clean them off and eat them. I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, it's, I, I'm not gonna, I won't drink any of it right now, but you, but it's, but, uh, but the IV organic is totally, it's non-toxic. I could drink it if I wanted to. I'm not going to though. It's got, uh, you know, but it has, it, everything in there is, it's non-toxic, it's is, organic. Is it, it's a plant-based so and milk-based compounds. So, you know, totally safe, no toxins. You can't say that about it, everything, with, especially with the neonics out right now, you know, uh, the, those poisons that are affecting the, you know, the bees with the colony collapse disorder. So, anyway, the question was, was, about, was about rodents, and, and we talked about organic. But, uh, you know. Um, anyway, we were talking about uh, IV organic using with rodents because the rodents, then of course they, they go up there and they, um, you could even spray it on the fruit and if they, they, you know, of course they nibble on the fruit, it tastes like, it tastes like garlic, tastes like rosemary, they don't like it. So it would protect and we, we talked about raccoons a little bit, but, um, so we talked, we spoke about rodents. Now, um, other pests that are significant for citrus are, are aphids, scale, um, mealybug, mites, black spot, sooty mold. Neem oil is incredibly good at, at uh, 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 obviously treating that. Um, and some of the trees that I've got over here are sprayed with neem oil. Um, neem oil is a, uh, it's basically a surface spray. Um, you wanna spray it at, uh, at night because it actually, like any oil, 
um, you know, put you put glass over something, the sun comes through it, it can cook and it can burn. It'll do that to the leaves, especially in the high heat. So with the neem oil, you can't spray it that morning. You spray it the day before, you let it settle in. Um, it's got a shiny look to it. The leaves look pretty cool, They're pretty glossy. Um, but those, all those, the aphids, the scale, the mealybug, mites, black spot, uh, sooty mold, neem oil is very good for that. It's a very good organic treatment. There are chemical treatments out there, but again, I don't use chemicals here. You know, I, I, try, I, I try to go entirely organic. But it's like, it's like in life, sometimes you need penicillin. If you had something that was out of control that you had to treat with, with a chemical, that would be the last resort. That works too. Yeah, haven't tried it, but that's that's uh, that's a good one as well. Um, okay, and that's uh, you know as far as uh, did you want to talk about uh, the three the the three and one in as far as as far as treating those pests as well? Sure. sure. Um, because we, we, we what we can do is is all what I'll do is I'll talk about the maybe the citrus uh, leaf miner and then the Asian citrus psyllid, and then we can take a walk and look at the citrus and we can talk about them. Okay, and the ivy organic. Okay. All right. Um, citrus leaf miner. Everybody knows about it. It's um, it's the thing that, that it's that ugly thing that appears in the middle of summertime, um, uh, and and that bug, and it just starts making those lines through the leaves, and the leaves curl up. Um, one of the best treatments, um, one of the best uh, uh, treatments for that would be spinosad. You know, as far as organic treatments go. IV organic also can be used against those uh, against those pests as well that I mentioned. And it, you can use it, what I would suggest is using it in combination, using like the spinosad, using the neem oil in combination with the IV organic, you know, alternating treatments on it. So because it's not good to, to, um, to overdo the neem oil or the spinosad in any case. The, 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 the safer soap also is probably, I'm sure is, is good and it's probably not toxic. But again, you have to try it and you have to see what's most effective for you. Um, but spinosad seems to be very effective against, against the leaf miner, and you have to wait. You don't want to spray it year round, you just have to wait till you see the first signs of it, you know, in, in, in your leaves, and that's, that's when you start doing it, and you just clip those leaves off. Um, I'd say maybe May or June you start seeing it, and, and all the way until fall. Um, don't use any neonics. That's, that's a, that's, we're trying to get away from that. I love those bees. Um, and then the last one we're talking about is the Asian citrus psyllid, HLB. How long the citrus screening? Everybody is, is familiar with that. It's, it's threatening the California citrus in, uh, industry. Um, it was found in the San Gabriel area, and if it gets up into the citrus belt up there in Fillmore, it could be it could wreak havoc. It's just it's it's a it's a scary scary. Uh, it, it goes on. It's basically the virus is carried on. The disease is carried on a uh, with an Asian. Uh, it, it piggybacks on an Asian citrus psyllid, and that's how it actually travels around. Um, and uh, you'll see blotchy model leaves, small irregular fruit, and um, basically the best way to control it is to treat the Asian citrus psyllid itself, to spray for that. Not, not you can't really, once the disease is there, it's the, the citrus greening. Well, actually you'll see it's when they sell it in the, in, in the stores, it scares a lot of people. There's a yellow tag on there, it says quarantine. And, it's, and, and you think, when you look at it, you think there's a problem with the plant. There's not, it just says CDFA. And there, it's a, and it says quarantine, and it's a yellow tag. It comes with all the citrus. Basically, it means the tree's been inspected. It passed. It made it to your, you know, to your local store. What are the signs of this disease? Well, okay. So, so again, mottled, basically, uh, mottled leaves. So the leaves are mottled. The spots, green. instead of yeah, over the green, it's mottled yellow. Instead of like, instead of like on on the margin, or the leaf turns entirely yellow, or the veins turn yellow, it's mottled. Um, you'll see that like with, um, uh, you know, with deficiencies or chlorosis, you'll see, um, you know, uh, the leaf is entirely yellow or there's, you know, magnesium deficiency, you'll see veins of it. But with the, with the uh, HLB, it's mottled and then the fruit is small, incredibly small and, and basically wrinkled. Out. Yeah. So that's, those are the signs of HLB. Um, right, at the, yes. Does HLB affect all citrus? Like kumquats and lines. Yeah. Any, yeah. Any, anybody, any, any of them in, that, in the family? Huh? Finger lines exempt. 
the, the Buddha, Buddha's hand? No, finger lime. Finger lime, okay. Um, so there's your answer. Uh, Charles, would you come up and, and, and talk a little bit? Charles is going to, we're going to continue the pest control um, conversation and we're, but, and, and we're going to talk about it. What, what so if you've enjoyed this educational opportunity brought to you by Ivory Organics in conjunction with the California Rare, Rare Fruit Growers of California, specifically the West Los Angeles chapter. If you like this, be sure to like it, and most importantly, by subscribing below, you'll be connected to this and all the other educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching, and happy gardening.